Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This case, as any past and future cases, are purely hypothetical, and any resemblance to any individual patient is purely coincidental. Let's start with a clinical scenario. This is a 23-year-old woman who's a right-handed student, and she has had a five-year history of tingling in the right little and ring fingers, and has been complaining of progressive grip weakness in the hand, and symptoms are present all the time. It's not clear if and when it gets worse. There's no diurnal variation to this, and it's been really bothering her. On clinical examination, we can see reduced muscle bulk in both the thena eminence and the first web space where the first dorsal interosseous muscle is. Tone throughout the arm is normal, however, power is reduced, particularly distally in the hand muscles, and these are three out of five, including digit extension, which is also week two. Sensation showed reduced pinprick to digit five only. Let's think about the differential diagnosis here. If we're considering individual nerves, the median nerve for example, yes, we've got weakness and wasting of the APB muscle, but this wouldn't explain the weakness and wasting of some of the ulnar innervated muscles and also sensation loss in digit five. Conversely, if we're thinking about ulnar neuropathies, then this also wouldn't explain the weakness and wasting of the APB muscle. Now, of course, it is conceivable that you can have both carpal tunnel and cubital tunnels at the same time causing a picture like this, but this would not explain the weakness of digit extension weakness in this scenario. So let's think about something a bit higher up. What about a brachial plexopathy? Well, if we think about medial cord, that, that could be a potential answer, but that would affect the median and ulnar innervated uh, muscles. And so this wouldn't explain finger extension. Perhaps a little bit higher up still, a lower trunk plexopathy. Well, that certainly could explain all of this, as indeed could a C8 T1 radiculopathy as well. So difficult to differentiate between those two just on clinical grounds alone. Could this be just some musculoskeletal problem? I don't think so. So let's have a look at the neurophysiology now. If we have a look at the sensory nerve action potentials, we have a normal right finger two response, but absent ulna, ulna dorsal cutaneous responses, and also absence of the medial antibrachial cutaneous sensory response two on the right hand side. And contralaterally, these were all very normal. So we've got good data for comparison. Let's have a look at the motor action potential. And here we can see for the right median APB responses, we have a little bit of distal motor latency prolongation. However, that is in the context of very small motor amplitudes. And so this would primarily be axonal loss here occurring. And we also have absence of the F wave. If we have a look at the first dorsal interosseous response, we can see it's also, that's at the very bottom, we can see it's also a very, very small motor amplitude. And when we compare back to the ADM, motor responses. Yes, these are reduced, but not quite in the same proportion as those of the first dorsal interosseous. And we've got no slowing of conduction around the elbow. So we're not dealing with combined carpal and cubital tunnel lesions here. Let's have a look at the EMG findings. And we first start off with the biceps, triceps and brachioradialis, which were all normal. However, when we come lower down into the arm, let's start with the APB and the first dorsal interosseous muscles, we can see fibrillations here, and we can see evidence of severe and chronic denervation, particularly in the APB and the IDIO, and to a lesser extent in the ADM muscles, but also involving the EDC and the EAP muscles too. Cervical and thoracic paraspinal muscle sampling was normal. So let's put this all together in terms of the overall picture. We have a combination of median, ulnar, and radial nerve fibers, which have all been affected, and we've got normal paraspinal muscle sampling. So in conclusion, we have evidence for a lower trunk brachial plexopathy. And in this clinical context, we must consider neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. Let's consider this from a clinical perspective. First of all, this is a very rare condition, which we as neurophysiologists only see once or twice a year, perhaps. Um, often these are mistaken 
as carpal tunnel syndromes in young patients, particularly ladies, who seem to have a predilection for this. And really it's kind of the carpal tunnel that doesn't make sense because you can see that the APB muscles wasted, but there's no sensory loss in the fingers. It's the so-called split hand. Um, on examination, I always advocate co-palpation of the APB and the IDO muscles. So what I do is when I get a hand in front of me, um, I not only palpate it for its APB muscle, but I also pinch behind and just feel the first web space and make sure that the first dorsal interosseous muscle is in fact healthy. Of course, if that's wasted, then the differential starts to become, are these co uh, coexistent neuropathies, median and ulna, is it a brachial plexopathy or is it a radiculopathy? Um, a really, really useful clinical concept to get your head around is differentiating between medial cord and lower trunk brachial plexopathies. And the way to do this is by looking at the radial innervated uh, distal muscles. And so we look at the EIP and the EDC as well. And in the case of a low trunk plexopathy, these will be affected, but medial cord lesions, which affect the median and ulnar nerve fibers only, will not affect those. A couple of points on the neurophysiology side of things. Uh, of course, it goes without saying, you really do need to have a good working knowledge of the brachial plexus before you get going. It's also really, really important to understand the concept of pre and post ganglionic lesions, because it's very difficult just on clinical grounds alone to differentiate between a C8T1 radiculopathy and a lower trunk plexopathy. And the way we do this is by looking at the sensory nerve action potentials, which will be affected in the plexopathies because these are post ganglionic lesions and will be spared in the radiculopathies because these are pre ganglionic lesions. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please do link up to some of the other videos in this series, which explain this in a little bit more detail. Um, I also am a firm believer about doing relevant studies without overdoing it for the patients because one can add a lot of extra tests uh, in any brachial plexopathy study, but without actually adding much information to the actual diagnosis or to the recovery, for example, uh, by simply just doing as many muscles or nerves as you can think of. When I was working at Queen Square, the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery um, here in London, um, I was very involved with developing work to try and get the optimal number of nerves and muscles tested without overcooking it for the patients. And these are some of the things that we put into our standard operating procedure for these kind of cases. So just to work through these um, sensory studies, you don't need to do every single digit, um, for example, just to, to get every median and ulna snap going. One of these is sufficient for the median, the ulna, radial, of course, the lateral antibrachial cutaneous and medial antibrachial cutaneous. These are really simple tests to do, actually, uh, if you do them in an order. And um, as long as you practice them, you'll get a good understanding of how to do these tests and what normative data are for them. Sometimes, of course, it's important to do contralateral studies when in doubt, but you don't need to do this for every single test. Um, you know, if it's abnormal, it's going to be abnormal. Um, motor studies, you don't really need to do that extensive studies in terms of stimulating up um, herbs points, etc. Um, you know, APB standard, APB and ADM standard tests are sufficient to above elbow. In terms of the EMG, this is the list here um, of muscles which we found from other brachial uh, plexus lesions to have had the maximum yield. Um, and also adequately cover the plexus. One thing I would say is that paraspinal muscle sampling is of course the cherry on the cake, but it really is just the cherry because you can get the diagnosis without actually doing them. So it's very nice to do, especially if you are au fait with these muscles. If you're not, then actually it doesn't necessarily add very much to it, the actual overall diagnosis. The final thing I'm going to say is clinical context because this is a case of a young lady who has got these symptoms and this problem and so therefore one's thinking about neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome if by contrast this was an older person who was a smoker one has to start thinking about brachial plexus infiltration from apical lung tumors and so it's all about clinical context 
So thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've picked up a couple of interesting clinical and neurophysiological pointers uh, with this. Please do support this channel, need your support, by liking, sharing and subscribing. It's really important for the YouTube rankings that you do this for me uh, and it really does support all the work that I do. So thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you in my next video shortly.